I tried the floor earlier, but it was a little crowded, which is fine. I love that the baptismal font is up here. I love that it reminds me all the time of my baptism. And I encourage you when you come up for communion and stuff to just dip your fingers in and remind yourself of your own baptism when you come up as well. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I have three stories that I want to share today to help us understand our gospel lesson. Um, and the first of those stories is actually what we heard read the first uh, uh, Old Testament reading that we heard read today. It's the, the giving of the Ten Commandments. So... The people, the Israelites, had just been led out of slavery in Egypt, delivered from slavery by God through Moses, and they've reached the the desert, the wilderness, and they're wandering, probably a little lost, like, okay, what happens next? What happens now? Some of them were even complaining and groaning. And so what God does is God comes, Moses goes up the mountain, God comes to Moses and says, here's how I want you to live together, here's how I expect you to live together. And gives them the Ten Commandments, along with a lot of other things. But the Ten Commandments are what we're focusing on today. And these Ten Commandments were something that set the people apart from all the other nations around them. At this time, there were a lot of different religions, a lot of different cultures. And they all worshipped a lot of different gods and idols. So this is the the first group of people that worshipped one god. Just one god. And, and, um, and, and that set them apart, and they had these rules to live by that a lot of other people weren't living by. And these rules were to help them be in relationship with each other, to love and serve one another, and to love and serve God. So the first three of the Ten Commandments, at least in the Lutheran way, sometimes people say the first four, we say the first three. So the first three have to do with our relationship with God, and the last seven have to do with how we are to live together with each other. And so there are rules, right? There's something that we're supposed to do, but there's a further meaning behind that. Just like we eat our vegetables and we exercise and we do these things that we're supposed to do, but it's not just because we're supposed to, there's a reason behind it, and that reason is to be healthy. And these reasons for the commandments were to help us be in relationship with God and with neighbor. And this was unusual because there, in, in the other religions, there, weren't, there wasn't a God that really wanted to know the people and be right there involved and be in relationships. So this was really different. And this is what the Ten Commandments are for. And so we're going to fast forward a little bit to the, uh, the book of Micah, one of the prophetic books. And at this time, um, in the 8th century BCE, there's a lot of turmoil in the lands. Um, and so the, the Israelite nation had split in two, and the north kingdom was Israel, and the south kingdom was Judah. And um, so they've already had some trouble with kings and everything, and they've already kind of forgotten their purpose as people. And, um, and now they're really becoming focused inward on themselves and really living in this lap of luxury and, um, and, and control, not realizing that all around them is chaos and they're about to be taken over because they're not paying attention. And so Micah comes to them um, from a little town about 25 miles of Jerusalem and shares with both kingdoms, actually, um, not just one or the other like many prophets, but shares with them that they need to get their act together. Every time, every service, I've forgotten to bring my Bible up here. So I want to invite you to turn to page 757 in the Bible in the Pew Bible. And on page 757, we have Micah chapter 6. And so Micah says in chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? And so Micah is essentially kind of looking at the same thing that Jesus did in our gospel today. Micah's looking at these people 
and seeing all the things that they're not doing, seeing that they've forgotten what the law, what the Ten Commandments are supposed to help them do. They're kind of just going through the motions. Maybe they're doing what they're supposed to do, but they've forgotten why. And so it's not meaning anything because they're not really doing it in the name of, of justice, of kindness, and of humility and loving neighbor as themselves. And so we're going to fast forward now about 2,700 years. So lots of years into uh, more modern times, if you can call the 1500s modern times, which they were compared to Micah's time. Um, but we're going to talk about Martin Luther for just a second. So Martin Luther was a monk. Um, he became a monk because he prayed to God to save him from a storm, and he was spared from the storm, and so he becomes a monk. And he enters and he starts to study the Bible, and he starts to get really frustrated because he realizes that he is not able to keep the Ten Commandments very well, to keep any of God's law. He's always messing up. And so Luther spends a ton of time in his room praying and repenting and soul-searching, even flogging himself because he feels like he's so bad and he's so angry because of this God that expects things that are completely impossible to do. And he's just going crazier and crazier until his friend, John Stoppitz, who is his friend and his mentor, comes to him and is like, this is not the purpose. This is not why we have the law. You are being way too hard on yourself. I'm going to send you on a trip, and I want you to find this, this, the true meaning. So he sends him to Rome. And on this journey, what he observes in Rome, people worshiping relics instead of God and, and thinking that that's what's going to save them. And then he comes back home, and there's the selling of indulgences. All of these things he realizes are not what God intended. And, and that's what starts the Reformation, essentially, He's, he realizes that the law isn't meant for us to beat ourselves up or to beat other people up. It's not meant for others, like the Catholic Church, to profit from. They're, they're essentially looking at people's misdeeds, and they're selling these pieces of paper to pay for a cathedral and telling people that their, their loved ones or themselves are going to go to heaven a little bit faster if they buy these pieces of paper. So they're taking our sinfulness, and they're profiting from it and using it to build up the church treasury. And that's not, Martin Luther's like, that's not what this is supposed to be about. That's not what following the law is supposed to be about. So there's three or four, maybe a few more lessons here that help us get to the gospel. The first lesson that, is that the law was meant to teach us how to live in relationship with God and with one another. And again, this was very different from other cultures because relationship with God was kind of a new thing. And we come to Micah, and Micah reminds us that when we come to the temple, it's about atoning or reconciliation. It's not just about coming to the temple because we're supposed to come to the temple and bringing these offerings because that's what God says to do. But it's about the why of the thing. It's about like we come to make amends. We come to make amends with God. We come to make amends with each other. We come to worship God. Abraham Heschel is a Jewish scholar, and he says that Micah 6 verse 8 is all about what true worship is. It's not that we want, God doesn't delight in all of those things that we're supposed to bring. What God truly delights in is the relationship with us. And then Martin Luther is perhaps an example we can relate to even a little more because it's a little closer to our time. Early on, he was so consumed that he just became so inwardly focused, and that's not what the law is supposed to do. The law is not supposed to make us focus so much on ourselves that we forget our neighbor and forget God and are just constantly working on ourselves. It's meant to be able to live more freely because we know what we're supposed to do, and we know when we've made mistakes. So we don't have to worry so much about ourselves all the time. And it's also not about worrying about other people's sins, but more about being in relationship with them and in Micah's time and in Luther's time, the law was especially not meant to help people profit over our sinfulness and our brokenness and our need for reconciliation. And so we come to the gospel today, which is Jesus cleansing the temple. There's all these people offering the things to do the thing, right? The, the sacrifices that were in the law. But Jesus comes in and he sees all all this stuff that we talked about today in play. He sees all of the things that we do instead of what we're really supposed to be doing. And he gets angry. He gets mad. Like, 
someone coming into your parents' house, right, and, and disrespecting your, their things and disrespecting them. And that's not about what it's about to go be with someone, right? You're, it's not supposed to disrespect you. We're supposed to be in relationship with those people and respect them and what's theirs. And so we would be angry too, right, if someone did that. But I think Jesus' anger is a little bit different too because I imagine that some of Jesus' anger comes from the deep, deep sadness he has at the tragedy in which he's observing that God's given us this really great way to make things right. And guess what? They're not doing it. He's made, given us a way to, to make things right and to live healthy and to serve God and serve neighbor. And here we are making a mockery of it. He finds people profiting. He finds people abusing the law, abusing atonement. He finds people forgetting why they've come to temple in the first place, which is to grow in relationship with God. It's not just to pass on through and do their diligent duty, like when you're you know, little and your parents are like, okay, say you're sorry, and you're like, I'm sorry, but you don't really mean it, right? Or like when you say hello to somebody and smile, but you don't really want to say that either, you know? You're not really meaning it. You don't really, it's not in your heart. You just do it because you know you have to. It makes me wonder sometimes then, too, do we gather here in worship to serve God and neighbor? Is that why we come? Or sometimes do we come because we know we should? Should is such a dangerous word. Do we come to church because we think we should? Um, is, it, is it just a great fellowship opportunity? I mean, of course we should come to church, worship. God wants us to do that. We want you to do that. We all want each other to be here, and we want to see each other and be in relationship with one another. So those, those things aren't wrong, but they're not the only reason, right? The reason that our hearts come to church is to worship God and be in relationship with God and to make things right and be freed from our sin and to go rejoicing in the fact that we have grace and that we have forgiveness, and so just like the Israelites, just like the people in Martin Luther's time, we now all fall short. The people who followed Moses, the Israelites later on, in Micah's time, Martin Luther's followers, and now we fall short every day. We don't always do the right things. Sometimes we don't come to worship to reconcile with God. Sometimes we don't love our neighbors which we say in our confession from time to time. Sometimes we treat the law as a to-do list. Check, check, did this. Sometimes we treat it as a morality meter. Sometimes, if we're honest, we even use it as a way to benefit from others that are struggling. But there's always good news, right? In the story of the gospel that seems like a confusing story about an angry Jesus that we're not used to seeing, I think that anger is really about a deep passion and concern that God has given us this thing to do that will help make us better and help serve our neighbor and love God. And so Jesus has come on in the gospel story today and he's cleansing the temple. He's washing it from all the wrongdoing and he's trying to bring it back to what it's supposed to be to set it straight. And in the waters of our baptism, Jesus comes and washes us clean. Jesus drives out the negligence and the selfishness of us and reconciles our hearts to God, even when we struggle. So in Lent, we're focusing on this gift of baptism, this thing that helps us remember the purpose of the law that washes all our mistakes away so that we can live and be free and to love and serve each other. It helps us prepare for the Easter celebration that again reminds us why baptism is possible and why we are washed clean. And lastly, I just want to say, thanks be to God that Jesus loves to clean. Amen.